Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Global Health Education Ireland Symposium 2020. My name is Eric O'Flynn. I'm the Program Director for Education, Training and Advocacy at the RCSI Institute of Global Surgery. This symposium is an annual event of the Forum of Irish Postgraduate Medical Training Bodies. Uh, I'm building on the very successful inaugural event held at the College of Anesthesiologists last year. This year, the event is hosted by the RCSI Institute of Global Surgery. I'm sure you're all very familiar with Zoom after the year that we've had, um, but just to point out a few differences between this Zoom webinar and standard Zoom meetings. All webinar attendees are muted. You can interact via the chat function and also the Q&A function. Please put your questions for today's excellent speakers into the Q&A box. And we'll put as many of these questions to the speakers as we can. The chat function is for general comments and discussions, and we won't be monitoring the chat function. The symposium is being recorded. The event is at full capacity, and we're not accepting any further registrations for today. However, for any of your colleagues that haven't registered, and may still wish, wish to watch the symposium, uh, we'll be sharing a link in the chat box to uh, RCSI's YouTube live channel where they can watch the symposium. The theme of today's symposium is learning from COVID-19, improving health for all uh, uh, in global health education. The program for today is on your screen. It's a very exciting lineup. In 2020, we've been uh, confronted by a major new challenge with the COVID-19 pandemic. With restrictions on travel and major disruptions to normal activities and healthcare services, the first session will look at new approaches and strategies for global health education. The second session will examine some of the current challenges of working with partners in far off countries when we cannot meet face to face. The third session, will reflect on the growing need for our health workforce in Ireland to be better equipped with global health skills due to uh, global issues such as migration, climate change, and the pandemic. Before we dive into the first session, I'd like to invite Professor Ronan O'Connell, President of RCSI, to welcome you all to the symposium. Good morning. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be invited to make some opening remarks on the occasion of this Global Health Education Ireland Symposium 2020, organized through RCSI Institute of Global Surgery and the Forum of Irish Postgraduate Medical Training Bodies. I had hoped to welcome you to this symposium in person, but unfortunately this is not possible for obvious reasons, as sadly we are in the throes of the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic here in Ireland. The meeting brings together all the medical specialties with a shared vision and ambition to improve healthcare in low and medium income countries with a primary focus on the education and training of healthcare professionals. You will hear from Ireland, WHO and Africa about the effects of COVID on local healthcare delivery. You will also hear how RCSI and our colleagues in the College of Anesthesiology of Ireland with the strong support of Irish Aid have been able to make a difference in surgical and anesthesiology training through collaboration with COSEXA and CANEXA. The Surge Africa project, as part of its many activities, has helped upskill district hospital surgical teams in Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. Uh, these are important foundations on which we in RCSI, with our partners in the forum, Irish Aid, COSEXA, CANEXA, are determined to build. I would like to congratulate Eric O'Flynn, Program Director, RCSI Institute of Global Surgery, and Professor Mark Schreim, who we welcome as our newly appointed O'Brien Chair of Global Surgery at RCSI, and their colleagues in RCSI for hosting this symposium. I'm particularly delighted to welcome Minister of State for Overseas Development, Mr. Colin Brophy, TD, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director, Health Emergencies Programme, WHO. Dr. David Weekliam, Chair, Global Health Strategic Working Group of the Forum. And Dr. Colm Henry, Chief Clinical Officer, HSE, who will all speak during the first session. 
I also welcome the many other contributors who will be introduced in the first session by Dr. Brian Canarns, uh, president of the College of Anesthesiologists in Ireland. And in session two, they will be introduced by Dr. Nadine Ferris France, Executive Director, Irish Global Healthcare Network. Thank you all for joining with us. Thank you all for contributing. And I look forward to a most productive symposium. Thank you, President O'Connell. Our the first session is entitled Global Health Education and the Pandemic. This will provide a high-level introduction, uh, uh, an overview of training and education for health professionals in the current global health context with COVID-19. In this session, we will take questions immediately after each talk. Please do put your questions into the Q&A box. Um, to give uh, opening remarks this morning, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Colin Brophy, TD, Minister of State for uh, Overseas Development Aid and the Diaspora. Minister Brophy was appointed to this post in July of this year. He's a Fine Gael TD representing Dublin Southwest. He was also a member of the Joint Committee on Justice and Equality and the Joint Committee on European Union Affairs. Mr. Brophy, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to speak to you today at this second annual Global Health and Education Ireland Symposium. I'd like to obviously start with a thank you to Professor Ronan O'Connell, President of the Royal College of Surgeons, and to Dr. David Wheatland, HSE Global Health Lead, for your kind invitation. Um, I thank you to all the speakers at the symposium for your contributions and to all your colleagues across the health sector in Ireland over the course of this year. I have been struck, as many of my government colleagues have, and all the people around our island by the professionalism, dedication, hard work and resilience of our health workers as we learn to navigate a pandemic. I know it isn't easy and it won't be easy, and that you depend on Irish society to do the right thing. And I say simply and sincerely, thank you. I was appointed, as mentioned, over the summer to the position of the Minister for Overseas Development Aid in the Diaspora. The uniqueness of this time makes this a first opportunity to meet with all of you and learn more about your work. I anticipate that our discussion today will inform my time as Minister. I hope that the next time we meet, hopefully, will be in person. The World Health Organization's Dr. Mike Ryan, a Mayo man, as we all know, says about the pandemic that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I know that Mike is with us today. And thank you, Mike, and thanks to all your colleagues in the World Health Organization. Importantly, Mike, your words remind us of the importance of not just engaging with and investing in better health outcomes at home, but also that we must also invest in better global health systems and outcomes. Achieving those better outcomes means that we must harness the talent and commitment, talent and commitment such as that represented at this symposium today. As a collective of health professionals, you should be proud of your contribution that you're making to global health, a contribution that Irish Aid is proud to support. Ireland has much to share in developing and improving health systems. We remain on the journey at home, but as an improved health outcomes and life expectancy in Ireland demonstrate, we've come a long way. We can share the lessons, both the positive and the negative from the changes we've made here in Ireland. In sharing lessons from home, we must also benefit from the good work of countless Irish doctors and nurses who worked over many decades across Africa and Asia. The inspirational work of these men and women has often involved making great personal sacrifices in very difficult circumstances. It has given Ireland a solid reputation from which we can build. The reputation has been enhanced by Ireland's effective global health response to what the World Health Organization describes as global epidemic of HIV and AIDS and more recently Ebola. I would like to again acknowledge the work of Mike Ryan's role in the fight against Ebola, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Ireland's international development policy, A Better World, is our guide for the coming years. The policy builds on what we are already good at. Irish aid has a strong track record in delivering for the poorest and most vulnerable. The policy recommits to realising the pledge of the sustainable development goals of reaching the furthest behind first. In order to reach those furthest behind, Ireland will focus its interventions on those areas that most directly impact on poor people's lives, on health, education, food security, 
and protection in the face of conflict or catastrophe. But in doing so, we will ensure that we are taking account of broad policy priorities, namely ensuring gender equality, reducing humanitarian need, addressing climate action, and improving governance. Global health is an essential part of the policy. Ireland's work in the field of global health, framed within a better world, has a number of priority areas of focus. Now, these include the prevention of infectious diseases, support for health systems, strengthening and improving the, uh, the improvement of maternal and child health, and improving access to sexual and reproductive health rights. All of those ambitions are now under threat, of course, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So COVID-19 requires us to devise a coherent response built around local ownership. Ireland has strongly supported the work of the UN to become more coherent on this. The World Health Organization plays an especially crucial role in this area. It provides guidance and leadership to countries on their response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Guidance which has helped us here at home. And importantly, it's also coordinating the global response, including targeting direct assistance to the most vulnerable countries. Ireland appreciates the role the WHO has played in tackling COVID-19 in countries with less advanced public health systems. In response, Ireland has increased its contribution to the WHO fourfold this year. Here today, though, I can see many colleagues with whom my department works closely to deliver our goals in global health and medical education and training. We need to build on these partnerships and in response to the pandemic being nimble, in forging new ones as circumstances dictate. For us, partnerships within health communities are critical in order for us to deliver on achieving safe and timely care for all. Supplemented by investments in infrastructure systems and materials and expansion of the workforce, this can really bring about transformational change in our healthcare systems. Since the turn of the century, regional cooperation supported by long-term international partnerships has enabled the rapid scale, rapid scale up of surgical training in East, Central and Southern Africa. The Irish Aid Funded or CSI COSECA collaboration programme has been pivotal in this scale up. We have seen what can be and continues to be achieved through partnership. And I'd like to take the opportunity to wish Professor Mark Shrine and Dr. Estella Etunga, who are both here with you today, great success in their relatively new roles within the RCSI and Prosecco respectively. But even before the COVID-19 pandemic, there were great challenges to building effective global health systems. There is a fundamental gap in essential healthcare services and the provision of care. We are counting on many of you here today, the global health community and medical and clinical experts, health professionals, researchers and educators to inform and guide us as we strive to forward in Ireland's commitment to global health. The challenges are even greater though, perhaps, and there is also greater international recognition of the need to collectively invest in global, global public health. I'm conscious that as challenge to our health systems has grown due to the pandemic, the challenges to the health and resilience of health workers has also grown. The World Health Organization has drawn attention to the unprecedented strain that COVID-19 has placed on the men and women at the front line of global health services. We know this all too well in Ireland, in our own country, where the HSE has already initiated a package to promote positive coping strategies amongst staff. In developing countries, the strains are almost unimaginable, with limited access to basic resources, as well as testing kits, ventilators and PPE. Investing in the self-care of these unsung heroes is an investment in sustainable healthcare systems themselves. When I came into the job, I said it was something I wanted to help address, well-being and resilience of healthcare workers in developing countries, particularly throughout this challenging time. So today, I can announce a partnership between Irish Aid and the HSE to support the mental health of frontline health workers in Ethiopia and Jordan. Both countries' health systems are facing particular strains with COVID-19, increasing the pressure on health systems already stressed by the requirements of hosting millions of refugees, regional conflict, and resource constraints. Building on HSE materials developed for the Irish context, the program will adapt these in partnership with Jordanian and Ethiopian health authorities to produce training and awareness resources which will promote self-care among staff. As well as pilot and counselling services, I hope that this innovative partnership will enable Ireland to shine a light on the well-being of health workers as well as mental health 
more broadly. In the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, which obviously is affecting everything we do. I also expect that we will learn valuable lessons from the pilot which we can take home, as well as informing Irish Aid's health interventions in other countries. But most importantly, this programme will help to underpin the well-being and resilience of health workers in Jordan and Ethiopia at a time when it's most needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Brophy. And uh, may I uh, applaud the announcement of um, your new program for support for uh, the well-being of, of health workers in Ethiopia and Jordan. That's uh, fantastic news. Uh, so I'd like to invite the attendees to put their questions into the Q&A function. Um, as we said earlier, not the chat function, but the Q&A function, and we'll put them to our speakers. What do you think of your, uh, when you put in your questions, I might take a moderator's prerogative uh, and ask one. Minister Brophy, um, can I ask why uh, at this time the, the focus on the uh, resilience, mental health and well-being of health workers, why uh, does, does Irish Aid and the Department of Foreign Affairs feel this to be so vital? Uh, thank you. First of all, just to say, I, I, I'm barely hearing your audio, uh, so I hope I, I got all of that. It was just very low. And it, it, it is absolutely vital. We're learning really from our own experience here in, in Ireland and what we've actually seen that over the course of this pandemic, which we've been dealing with now since effectively the end of February, March of this year, um, that one of the greatest strains is in the whole area of wellness and mental health. And there's particular impacts in that area on frontline workers. And um, so when I started in my job, one of the areas that I thought that we could focus on and have some real deliverable on is trying to put in place a program that would deliver some of the type of benefits that healthcare workers in Ireland can access, but that just are not you know, at all accessible. But the strains and stresses that are there, whether they be in Jordan or whether they be in Ethiopia or whether they be in countries anywhere throughout the world are exactly the same for those workers. So I, I, I think there's a huge benefit to the, 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 the pilot program we're, we're announcing today and I think it should be and, and hopefully will be rolled out in a much greater way, because without those supports for the frontline workers, the actual whole system of providing the healthcare in the longer term and dealing with COVID, I think we've all now begun to recognise, regardless of vaccine development or not, is going to be a much longer uh, period of time than people maybe originally thought of back in March. Thank you, Minister Brophy. Uh, you. So uh, we have a very short time, unfortunately, today. So I think we have to keep things uh, moving. We have uh, maybe one more question we could put to you very quickly. Uh, yes. From um, Kristen Ross, what have these health, how have these healthcare workers informed you? Uh, sorry, what have healthcare workers told you that will be helpful in caring for, for healthcare staff? Well, it, it, it ties back. We, we, we've had a lot of opportunities to engage with healthcare workers through um, both the NGO groups that we work with um, overseas and with Irish officials. And that feedback has really helped shape this programme. So it has helped in, in terms of what they were looking for is that, as I say, that essential um, ability to have someone just to step back and provide that service to them. So when we were looking at this as to how we would do it and how we would put in place the most targeted approach, we very much based it on their requirements to have that support to, uh, there for them. And the particular, obviously, specifics of how it will be delivered and everything will be worked at using the principle, which I outlined earlier in my contribution, that you actually devise it locally on the grounds, taking the context of what we do here in Ireland, but working with our local partners to devise a very localised response. Because I think it is vitally important that we recognise in this day and age that there isn't a, a one solution for everything. So rather than be prescriptive here, I would say that what we've heard in terms of the requirements is very similar, no matter where we are in the world. As a matter of fact, I have been struck by, I've made maybe, uh, I'd say the guts of 100 plus of these type of Zoom conference calls and things to organisations and groups right around the world. And the similarity of experience of people dealing with COVID in the front line is so overwhelming. It actually 
um, no matter whether you're talking to people in New Zealand, whether you're talking to people in Africa, whether you're talking to people in North America or South America, our home closer to here was in Europe, um, this, the strain and the stress of the people who are working nonstop on the front line comes through in all those conversations to us. And that really was one of the guiding things for me in terms of wanting to see this set up and announcing it today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And I think that's a, a very important point you raised there about the similarity of experience despite very different contexts. Moving along, our second speaker in the session um, is Dr. Mike Ryan. Dr. Ryan is the Executive Director of the WHO Health Emergencies Programme and has been at the forefront of managing acute risks <clears throat> to global health for nearly 25 years, including leading the WHO response to the SARS and, and Ebola outbreaks. He's also served as the Senior Advisor on Polio Eradication uh, for the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, um, and is a founding member of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. I'm sure we've all become much more familiar with Dr. Ryan this year uh, as he plays a leading role in the world's fight against COVID-19. Dr. Ryan, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, thanks very much, Ron, and, and, and thank you to uh, Minister Brophy for an excellent intervention. And may I just say, like he said, uh, to just celebrate the, the, men, the women and men uh, in Ireland who have worked on the front line and those who have continued to work on the front line for so many years abroad. Uh, in the service of those who have least. Um, uh, I, I'm joined here today by uh, my partner in crime, Dr. Gaia Gamawega, and uh, Gaia leads our whole health training on the emergency side and is a huge part in defining WHO's learning strategy going forward and the establishment of our new foundation. So she'll be here to answer any, any of the tough questions. Thank you, Gaia. Uh, just very quickly, I was going to share a few slides. I don't know if that's uh, there. Um, um, good. Okay. Uh, next slide there. Okay. Uh, let me do this. Okay. Just want to quickly address uh, three issues with you today, uh, just to reflect on how the world has changed in relation to uh, education and health. Uh, what are we doing in WHO and our global training response in relation to COVID and what is that showing us about the challenges we must overcome for the future of training for public health and health in, in general? Next one, you'll do it, okay. So, um, in some senses, uh, COVID has been a huge, has had a huge impact on our systems, a massive punch to the system, but the world wasn't necessarily going in the right direction before, and COVID has been more of a revealer of existing fragilities, inequities, lack of flexibility, lack of scalability in many things from supply chains uh, to clinical care. But in, in the main, you know, looking at our health workforce, and if we talk about infrastructure, the word infra means beneath, underneath the foundation, and we often think of infrastructure as bricks and mortar. But in a health system, the true sub-foundation uh, of effective health care is muscle and bone and brain and sinew uh, of, our, our, of our health workers. Uh, they are the health system. Uh, and in that sense, we are already not doing terribly well in, in both scale and, and, and training and, and competence of those workers around the world. Uh, but certainly in this pandemic, uh, real-time education, training and learning is really for the first time become a core element of global and national responses to COVID-19. Uh, frankly, most of us can't believe how much we've gone online with basic communication and conferencing uh, and certainly uh, we hope that we were ready thanks to Gaia's leadership to take advantage of that digital revolution and have been doing uh, a, a lot of work in this space which I'll explain in a few minutes but in a sense it's 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 really highlighted uh, the urgent need to rethink how we do medical and public health education and it's a great credit to the to the to this conference and to the partnership it brings together in Ireland that you are pathfinders. You already have been doing this. You've been looking at this systematically, collectively. You're the ones that deserve the credit. You push us forward, and we do look forward to stronger collaboration with you all in the coming months as we develop the, the foundation, the WHO learning strategy, uh, and, and many other things. Uh, digital technology and obviously biotech are revolutionizing medical education uh, and creating the, the need for lifelong learning. No longer what you learn in school or learn in college is good enough. L learning is moving, uh, and the need to learn is a constant lifelong process. 
um, and how do we use evidence-based knowledge to uh, apply and apply learning science to, to that. Uh, in terms of those um, warm bodies that we need, so there's a shortfall at least of 18 uh, million health workers worldwide, um, and, uh, uh, and also a, a difficulty in transferring that capacity into emergencies, the ability to move and be flexible, to surge, put the resources where they're needed, uh, and then scale up quickly in the area requiring the, the response. It's not just a matter of numbers, it's a matter of how that system is managed uh, and how health workers are able to, uh, to move and be reprioritized within the system and sometimes retrained within the system in real time. 70% uh, of the global health force are women, and, and in fact, the further you go down in the system, the more that number increases. In the front lines in many developing countries, 90% of the healthcare system is delivered by women. They're the least paid, the least recognized, and they are the ones who have lower access to education and, more importantly, decision-making than men. And I can tell you from my experience in the field, uh, I can confirm that that is the case. So how do we have a health service in every country, at every level, delivered by women and managed by men? Uh, it's, uh, for me, I, I find it hard to, to understand, uh, and it's something that simply must change. Uh, equally, the digital divide, regardless of the gender divide, is real. Only about a half of the world has Internet access, even though we talk about the fourth industrial revolution and we talk about the digital age. The reality is it's, it's a digital wall now for many people that they have to try and climb. And when you put that together with gender, only 20% of women in Africa are online. Next. Um, in terms of uh, what we've been doing uh, in response, uh, and in, uh, this has been a huge scale-up of our capacity to codify emerging knowledge on COVID, package that, transform that using learning science, translate that into local languages using crowdsourcing of volunteers in countries, regularly reviewing everything we do. Today we have 4.5 million user uh, registrations from every country and territory on this planet for the eight, 18 main thematic areas and in 41 languages. Um, and massive growth from 180,000 in January 2020 uh, up to where we are now. That acceleration could not have occurred unless we had already built the platforms. We had already built the learning science tools, the translation tools, and the ability to do that quickly. We were ready uh, to be able to take advantage of that, uh, of that revolution and expand rapidly. And I think that shows the value of preparedness. It's very hard to build from scratch in an emergency. What you do is you build from what you have, and if that is flexible and scalable, then you can move quickly. Be first, be fast. It's very hard to be first and be fast if, if, if you haven't uh, got the basic infrastructure in place. Next slide, please. Um, this is openwho.org, the thing I referred to before. Um, uh, within our, a guy and our team are under huge pressure all the time because our emergency response framework says that she and her team within 72 hours of, an, of a declared emergency have to be making knowledge available online. Uh, and that is sometimes even before uh, global emergencies uh, would be declared. Um, um, how, what we've done with openwho.org is massively scale up and try to focus on access, removing the barrier of cost uh, digital access as well. We have very low bandwidth and offline versions of everything we do, languages and culture. Uh, I think one of the most positive feedbacks we get from people around the world is I think they're quite amazed in 41 languages that they can see material in their language uh, that is fully quality assured and they're not having to also struggle with translating language as well as translating science and knowledge. Um, ensuring quality is a very big part of this and a lot of the work here in terms of publication review and ensuring that we're, we're, we're presenting the best science and the best application of science. Um, and this week, just as an example, we've launched uh, seven new courses related to clinical management. And these were developed uh, through the very extensive clinical management network that WHO has, which includes 300 experts, clinical experts from around the world. Though they will roll out in multiple languages in, in the coming weeks. Next slide there. Um, we won't stop there because I think in some senses the openwho.org has been a learning laboratory for us, a place in which we've been able to innovate, uh, develop use cases, apply these, uh, this knowledge and skill. 
but we recognize that that's not enough. Uh, and the Director General, Dr. Tedros, has really put us on a course for a complete revamping of WHO's learning strategy across the house, both for our own staff and in relation to the health workforce around the world. The Academy is moving forward very, very quickly, and we would very much look forward to collaborations with everyone on this uh, VC. So many of you there, I know David Le Weekly and will we'll, we'll, uh, we'll speak in a few minutes, a personal hero of mine and others who have really, really given their whole lives to creating equity uh, in developing countries, uh, directing Ireland's uh, best resources towards that and with a focus uh, on learning. We would love to have you as partners in this enterprise. We've also carried out uh, extensive surveys and literature reviews and looking at what our clients want and what they actually need. Uh, and we've done that across all our regions and at all levels of the system. They really do, the replies we're getting, you know, focus on uh, very much about improving access. People want access to that material. Uh, they want to know that that material is of the highest uh, quality. They want, at the global level, and you'll be interested in this, is really trying to establish what are the global level goals of, of health education or health workforce education? What are the priorities? Can we establish a global curriculum? Can we all agree to global standards? And then can we adapt that to the local context? Um, but we also need to address these current needs we have, but there is a future, and there's much more coming down the pipe in terms of the various stresses that health systems are under and allowing our workers to take advantage of the new revolutions, the biotech revolution, the IT revolutions, and other things. Uh, there is no point having revolutions in the sky with none on the ground. And uh, unfortunately for me at the moment, we have great hope uh, uh, at the atmospheric, stratospheric level, but we have not translated that into real solutions for frontline health workers as yet. There are good examples of how that's been done, but it's not a systematic process that's driven with clear objectives uh, and clear targets for us to be delivered. Uh, next. Uh, you'll see there in these slides some of the feedback from our frontline workers in various countries, uh, from Gambia, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I think if you did the same survey in Ireland, you'd get exactly the same responses from our frontline health workers. Next there, Prim. Yep. Some more uh, f uh, focuses on, on e-learning, on future learning. Um, and this idea of things being focused on evidence, but also focused on practical guidance that helps frontline workers in their day-to-day -day lives. The, the vocational aspect of training, as opposed to the academic aspect of training, applied learning. Obviously, to go with that, and this is one of the challenges, once you give people knowledge and you give them new skills, they need the tools, they need the infrastructure, they need the PPE, they need the rapid diagnostic kits, they need the monitoring capacity, they need the IT tools, they need the monitoring systems, the early warning systems. So there's a lot of uh, software and hardware to add to the wetware of the front line of, uh, of the, the health workforce. But frankly speaking, we can circle the airport on infrastructure forever. Unless we fundamentally commit to our frontline health workforce, we will not get anywhere. Uh, and again, this is a, a huge challenge, and I thank the Minister for his commitment to that and the Irish government for their leadership in this space. Next. Uh, so, finally, challenges to overcome, and I say this with a great deal of hope, and the last 10 months has been a strain and a struggle uh, for us all, and we've all fallen over various fences. None of us are perfectly happy with everything we've done on our own performance. We all have to get up every morning and recommit ourselves to doing what we can do to stop this pandemic. But through all of this, one of the bright and shining lights has been the way in which all of us have managed to transfer knowledge to frontline workers. I think we've, we've, we've all found a way to, to make uh, everything from clinical care to contact tracing to mental health. And uh, again, the minister and yourself everyone spoke about wellness and mental health. There's training for that too. And I think this is something we take for granted. Uh, we assume health workers, if they're properly equipped and they have the right training, can do their job. We all know, I'm um, a personal testament to that myself, working in the front line under stress uh, is very, very difficult. Uh, the health workers suffer, their families suffer, their communities suffer. Um, and we also, within this context of learning and a learning strategy, have to take into account the self-learning that's needed uh, to manage stress and wellness, but also the supports that we need to put in place to ensure that all health workers have access to the proper support and services that they need. So we need to expand access. We've said that before. Standard and high-quality learning. 
we need to go beyond health systems and beyond doctors and nurses and, and include everybody in that concept of health workforce. A hygienist, a logistician are just as important uh, to, to the health response. And we have to look at the broader prevention area in health because right now climate, environment and other things are having a major impact on health outcomes and we have to broaden our concept of those who contribute to health and the training that they need to understand the health issues uh, and apply that knowledge. We need to be better at respecting learner needs because sometimes this has become a didactic process. I have wonderful knowledge that I wish to share with you uh, and therefore you must be in a position to understand how I'm delivering this. Instead of having that view of the world, how can we share our wonderful knowledge, we need to turn that around into how can we create circumstances in which learners have more control on the process can come and go from training as they need, that we respect frontline workers who are very, very busy. They can't attend that seminar. They can't spend the weekend doing that because they haven't seen their family in, in a week. How are we going to create a mechanism of knowledge transfer that actually works to the time needs uh, and the time availability of our frontline workers, that allows them to control the experience, not us to control the experience? Um, that sort of idea of peer learning, micro learning, uh, and, you know, we've had this, it's very important, we have this very certification-based approach to learning uh, and meeting academic needs. We want to be moved more towards competency-based learning and having competences that can be verified rather than academic qualifications that can be certified. They're very important, but we really want to push towards competence-based approaches. Uh, and overall, strengthening the learning e ecosystem, the knowledge networks like you have created in Ireland, um, sharing our resources, inter-country collaboration, co-creation, uh, uh, and I love that word co-creation because that means everybody's involved, even the recipients uh, in the process. So um, I'm speaking uh, what I, I think uh, are, are words I've been on this journey myself, uh, a learning journey around health education. Uh, Gaia and her team uh, and many outside have really championed this principle in our house. I think WHO is transforming entirely in the way we see health education and education of health workers. Um, and we're very, very pleased that we've made significant progress in that. Still many hills to climb. We look to you in Ireland for guidance, for leadership, for collaboration. Um, and uh, I trust that we will be able to accelerate and amplify that in the coming weeks, months, and years. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Dr. Ryan, for a, a wonderful talk. Uh, again, please put your questions into the, the Q&A box and we'll address as many of those um, as possible. Uh, first question, Dr. Ryan. Um, in many, many LMIC contexts, training of sufficient numbers of healthcare workers is very challenging. Universities in high income countries have moved much of the health professions curricula online. Is this now a moment for strengthening health education partnerships between universities in high income countries and low and middle income countries? No, absolutely. And, and that concept of, 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 you know, we've seen this work in labs and other areas, that concept of twinning. And now that we're in this uh, electronic age, this digital age of remote support, we've all become much more comfortable with the idea that we can engage and work together even when we're not physically together. And I think that opens up a world of possibilities for the kind of networking that's going to be needed. Um, it really is, uh, I, I think we need to look at all of the accelerators. What are the initiatives that are going to accelerate each and every element of this from curriculum development to delivery and all, and, and all of that? And I think the idea of bringing institutions in the, in the global north and the global south together is excellent. But I also think we need to look the other way. There are lessons that have been learned in the global south on how to do business, how to do public health, that the north needs to learn. Community-based approaches, community-based primary health care, access to health care for all, the ability to do real-time public health intervention, contact tracing, all of that, the idea of community engagement. When I talk to my colleagues from, from Africa, when they, in epidemics, and I've been doing this for longer than I care to remember, uh, the first, and this is a huge generalization, but if you talk to the northern experts in the field with you, they'll always talk about the epi curve and they'll always talk about the modeling and what we need to do and projections and all of that, right? My African colleagues, almost exclusively when we talk about the epidemic and what we need to do next, they'll talk about the community. They'll talk about engagement. They'll talk about these things. So I do think this isn't a north-south issue. 
This is a north-south north issue. We have to transfer knowledge and technology from the south as well. And I think those of you who've all worked in, in the global south will, will understand that inherently. So I do think we need to make this a partnership, uh, not a transfer. Uh, and the more we can build those longer term initiatives between groups of institutions in, in Europe and Ireland and then institutions in, in the south, and we can create those real partnerships uh, that have real local objectives, then I think we will make progress. Thanks, Dr. Ryan. Thanks, Dr. Ryan. Um, a very important concept of uh, two-way learning, um, I'm sure. Um, one more, we've time for one more question from uh, Dr. Okeni uh, from Uganda. Um, what will be the strategy for real-time learning for the nearly 80% of health workers in Africa without sustainable online access? Um, great. I'm just going to ask Gaia uh, to, to speak on that, because first of all, I'd like you to meet her because I believe many of you will uh, have interaction with her. And this is something that's a, a really good question. And thank you to our colleague from Uganda, because this is the core of the issue. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And thank you, colleague from uh, Uganda, for the question. Uh, this is the nut to crack. Uh, the strategy will really look at, uh, as Mike said just now, about learning in multiple directions about learning uh, through co-creation, co-sharing. So the network ecosystem model is going to be very important. The second is to really appreciate people don't learn just from knowledge, but they create knowledge from what they hear, what they get, but through their own experiences. And that's why colleagues at the front line in, in Africa and in countries like Uganda are so important. Um, the Learning strategy also looks at lifelong opportunities that are equitable. So currently, while knowledge exists, uh, many colleagues in Uganda and other countries don't have access to this. One of the bigger issues with the learning strategy is we're working with, for example, the International Telecommunications Union, and not just sitting by and saying there's a digital divide, but really they are working with governments to increase digital access. So there are uh, unique roles that WHO, uh, frontline workers, associations in Ireland such as yourself can play. But unless we bring all of this together to make sure there's accessible, scaled up, fair, flexible, lifelong learning, nothing is going to change. The most important thing is to align the learning strategy to our health objectives whether they're the global health objectives, the SDG3 or our triple billion, country objectives, but also community and objectives that individuals, you and I have for our own health. And with the uh, biotech revolution where people are getting more information about their health, uh, you know, I was surprised to find out yesterday there are 90 million, you know, uh, personal devices sold just by one company to measure your, your heart rate and blood pressure. We know even in Uganda, 80% of deaths are caused by non-communicable diseases. So it's a really complex issue. We are hearing, we are using these principles, and very soon in November, December, the WHO learning strategy will be open for public consultation and member state consultation. So I really encourage the colleague from Uganda and everybody um, on this call to please participate. So we have principles, we know what's happening, and we want to really make this relevant and useful. Over. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Okay. Thank you very much. There's a very clear call to action for us all to, to participate in that process. Um, we, we would love to, to continue this conversation at much greater length, but unfortunately, we're going to have to, to, to leave it there. Dr. Ryan, Dr. Gaia, uh, many thanks for joining us uh, today, and we hope you'll, you'll stay on for uh, some more of this discussion. Great, thanks. We'll stay around for a little while. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing David. Uh, moving on to our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Colin Henry. Uh, Dr. Henry is the Chief Clinical Officer with the HSC. Um, he's been in that role since uh, April 2018. Uh, in this role, Dr. Henry collaborates with the HSC's Chief Strategy Officer, Chief Operations Officer, and senior leaders across the health services to ensure evidence-based, clinically informed decision-making in line with identified priorities. Dr. Henry, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, thank you, um, Eric, and if you could just, uh, somebody could manage the slides, thank you. Uh, just before I start, I'd like to acknowledge um, 
the work of David Weekly and Philip Crowley in this area. They've been uh, leading out in this on behalf of HSC, and um, we're very proud of what they've done on our behalf and behalf of Ireland in their work uh, abroad. So um, in this presentation, I'm going to look at the, uh, the global COVID situation and what we can learn from, from developing countries and the importance of taking a global approach to healthcare in Ireland, which has been reinforced by our experience in the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, some mention of the HC programme to support developing countries, particularly in education and training that Mike Ryan uh, eloquently described, and how the HSE has responded to um, the challenges of COVID-19 in, in, its, in its work in this regard. So next slide, please. So looking at the current global situation, um, it's a very uneven impact across different regions. And uh, really the story of the past few weeks has been the rapid escalation of cases in Europe, a doubling of cases in Europe in the past 10 days. We were quite alarmed. We saw 100,000 cases per day over seven days period in Europe. It's now up to 200,000 cases per day, 7.58 million total cases and um, almost quarter of a million deaths. And we see measures being introduced, considered introduced right across Europe from curfew to extensive social restrictions as each country grapples to control um, what is phase two of, of this illness. And um, looking worldwide, we we're struck in this map by a very uneven impact across different regions. Uh, so next slide, please. So there's a contrasting pattern between Europe and Africa. The narrative in, in, in Europe really has been uh, a second phase beginning with trickles in July and August as the initial social restrictions were eased with uh, increasing number of cases among younger age groups um, and outbreaks among younger age groups. And inevitably, despite all the learning and all the experience and all the measures that were brought in, all the testing, all the tracing, it was inevitable this, despite a lot of magical thinking that this would seep through to um, to, um, uh, to older age groups and to congregated settings is what we're seeing in Ireland. And I suppose the only thing that's surprising in, 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 is that people think it's a surprise that, th that the pattern of the virus and its transmission, its, its, its transmission pattern has changed. In Africa, we see um, a different, uh, a, a, quite a different pattern, as you can see there from that slide, um, with uh, death rates being relatively low compared with Europe, perhaps explained by a younger age profile, more people living in rural areas, less travel, but undoubtedly due to the uh, more the greater experience of having public health measures. Um, next slide, please. So looking across, um, there's broad similarities um, between uh, uh, I, I, between uh, our approach in, in, in Ireland and Europe and in Africa. Uh, but interestingly, we face uh, similar challenges, and I suppose some of the um, uh, perhaps presumptions and assumptions about European type healthcare have been blown open by the by the pandemic and we find ourselves challenged with testing capacity uh, we find ourselves with um, challenge with hospital capacity with uh, itu bed systems ventilators and so on that are have been incapable of dealing with unmitigated transmission patterns so all countries are including the the, the so-called developed world have been uh, severely disrupted by, in, in the face of unmitigated transmission patterns of COVID-19. And the other quite common challenge is that uh, is the impact of, of the social restrictions. And in Ireland, we have our own, we've, we've seen papers from our pediatric colleagues showing the great impact on children's health and well-being, vaccination, uh, qu uh, quarter of all referrals to Tuzla come from school settings. So there's been a huge disruption to children's health, well-being, and um, um, uh, and continuity of development in terms of the shutdown. And we have a paper in my office from, from older people showing similar patterns of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of secondary harm due to the restrictions brought in. So again, this is a common challenge right across the world. Next slide, please. So um, what can we learn um, from other countries? Uh, well, they certainly have more experience in dealing with health crises of a similar nature. Um, example uh, in one of our two partners one of our partners Mozambique is, is cyclones major flooding flooding and cholera outbreaks and Africa has a more unique and uh, direct experience of controlling serious infectious disease such as Ebola and HIV and uh, the other thing of course is uh, African countries uh, have a long experience of taking a whole government approach to health crisis which requires a uh, strong government le leadership strong surveillance response systems and effective engagement with communities. And one of the problems we see in, in the European experience, especially in the second wave, 
is is that kind of uh, integ in, integrated whole government approach each country grappling to, to get it right as it struggles with risks counter risks and um uh, both from the direct effects of covid the shock the unprecedented shock to uh, the healthcare system and an unprecedented shock also to, to economy and other aspects of, 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 of life next slide please so this uh, covid has reminded us uh, not just of the globalization of of it is often spoken about in the world with globalization of health and it, it, it forces us to recognize the transnational nature of health issues determine solutions and really the, as um, we, the Irish Shan says there is no alternative but working together and there is no greater strength than people working together uh, next slide please um, so this, um, for us in Ireland, the HD can't deliver a high-class health service unless uh, we're connected and engaged with the rest of the world. And again, it's been eloquently described by Mike Ryan and WHO. This is a whole world response. Uh, and that whole world involves not just European countries uh, uh, responding in, in the traditional way they might respond by leaning into their well-developed acute hospital systems but uh, reaching into public health experience because public health experience, public health measures are the only robust line of defense in the face of such an overwhelming pandemic. And COVID-19 is, is a good example of a global health threat, which, uh, uh, which forced us to work together. And we can learn from other countries. An example from Ethiopia here, a clinic here, a population of more than 100 million people, as just about 1% of the per capita healthcare resources we have in Ireland, yet they've developed a strong primary care system ensuring everybody has access to essential healthcare. Next slide, please. Um, so in addition to, we, we need to act in solidarity with other countries. And here you see the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are displayed on the wall in the headquarters, of the HSE in Obstacle Houston Station, Dublin, Stevens Hospital. And they're proudly displayed there for, for all to see. And to remind us all of um, the solidarity that's required, the Mehel spirit, that's an essential component, or an essential uh, framework around which we build our, our, our fight against COVID. Next slide, please. Now, the HSE uh, clearly has this as, as a principal deliverer of healthcare in Ireland. It has a major, if not primary, role in, in fulfilling Ireland's commitments to, uh, to the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, number three being to ensure healthy lives, promote well-being for all ages. And it requires us and, and, and asks of us to take actions, not just in Ireland, but to support developing countries in addition. Next slide, please. And as a, through the work of David and Philip and, and their colleagues, um, we have developed links to many countries. The Global Health Programme has, has helped many HSE staff, institutions, hospitals to engage globally with, um, with developing countries in Africa and Asia with a view to improving the health and quality of healthcare to building a more sustainable healthcare systems there based on the learning we have of quality improvement um, the philosophy of quality improvement and the technology associated and all the learning that goes with us and this slide gives us a snapshot of some of those on-site learnings the esther iron program with funding support from irish aid has supported 30 hospitals primary care services training institutions other institutions to collaborate uh, with these countries um, next slide please in addition, we work uh, nationally with uh, health services in uh, in Africa. We have bilateral agreements with the ministries of health in Mozambique, Ethiopia, Zambia, and Sudan. And there's a picture of uh, Philip prou proudly signing forms to, to, to give effect to that collaboration with those uh, ministries. Next slide, please. A case study uh, that, that Philip and his colleagues have led out on is Mozambique, where education and training at the heart of this uh, it's building and resilience and sustainability program uh, and um, where the Philip through his work in quality improvement in the HSE has um, extended that learning to 14 hospitals in Mozambique involving training workshops for teams there, training of trainer workshops, hospital coaching visits and virtual coaching webinars through Zoom. Next slide please. And what does this add up to? Well, here's an example of one uh, very real manifestation of the outcome of quality improvement, technology and learning, and how it can be applied to a real setting with real outcomes. This hospital is a Jose McCamel hospital, identified a problem, high level of deaths within 24 hours in the medical ward, averaging 11 per month. At the end of the training in 2017, this had reduced to four per month. And when uh, the team visited earlier this year, they found this improvement had continued year by year, as shown in this graph there. 
uh, from 58 deaths in 2017 to just eight deaths in 2019. Next slide, please. Another example is Mavalani General Hospital, looking at waiting times for gynecology outpatients to reduce the waiting time from 60 days to 30 days. This goal was achieved by 2020 and further improved to seven days uh, for the initial visit and 20 days in total for initial and follow-up visits. So um, needless to say, we face similar challenges here in Ireland and the same technology, the same uh, learning, the same velocity of quality improvement and, um, um, and its rolling cycle of improvement can, can be equally applied to our own healthcare systems. It has been successful in many cases. Next slide, please. I mentioned earlier this experience uh, of cross-governmental approach and the Ministry of Health in Mozambique has really engaged and taken on uh, the leadership of quality of care and a Directorate for Quality and Standards was established in 2017 and as a result the Ministry of Health is implementing national quality improvement projects on a whole range of, 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 of issues directly leading to uh, improved experience, improved outcome for patients. Next slide please. Um, one other aspect worth touching on is, is, is our own um, approach to uh, um, tackling migration of healthcare workers uh, from developing uh, countries. Um, um, we, we ourselves have uh, considerable challenges in our own workforce profile between consultants who are not gone through recognised training schemes to a very high proportion of our of our doctors not on training scheme not on uh, training schemes themselves. Perhaps half of our junior doctor population are not uh, uh, on training schemes, and many of those come from developing countries. But um, and one third of doctors trained in Ireland have trained in other countries. But Ireland has committed to the WHO Global Code of Practice, and it was be begun by Frank Murray's predecessor, National Doctors Training and Planning, Irish McGovern. And the Code of Practice and International Recruitment of Health Person Personnel encourages to reduce reliance on foreign trained personnel. personnel. But what Eilish started was under an um, international medical graduate training initiative was that doctors from Pakistan and Sudan would, would be provided with a structured two-year program in Ireland to receive training and gain clinical experience and then return to their own country. And I'd just like to acknowledge the work of Ronan and the RCSI in, in, in this regard in providing that training and enabling to date, over 300 doctors have been completed that program and returned home to bring the experience they've garnered in, in our own healthcare system back to their own countries where everybody can benefit. Next slide, please. So in responding to the pandemic, um, this commitment, this engagement, these relationships, this collaboration are all the more important as outlined by Mike Ryan. And now is not a time just because we've we urgently reconfigured a healthcare system back in March, April to become, become a COVID system. But now we realize this battle is going to be longer. We have to uh, make sure we hold on to what is precious and um, that we um, that we hold on to all, all this work that has been done, all these relationships that have been built, all the improvement has been gained and don't allow it to be unraveled because of short term need. Next slide, please. So we continue to support um, low income countries. Um, uh, despite some challenges, I mentioned some of our staff being redeployed as we reconfigure our service, but at senior management level, and my, my commitment as CCO, and I know from uh, Paul Reid's commitment, is absolute to this programme and will be maintained uh, whatever the challenges we face in the coming months or years. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of coming to the end now, um, uh, uh, we've supported our partners in managing uh, the outbreak is the part these partnerships build up in Mozambique and other countries to maintain essential services, services protect healthcare workers, and also that gain uh, that uh, whole overarching theme, as I mentioned, of not just responding, but in building resilience within existing healthcare systems. So as to, uh, so that these uh, changes, these improvements can can last longer than the, the original input of people such as David and Philip. Next slide, please. So we've continued that uh, as we've managed to develop, innovate at home with a huge surge in virtual consultations and alternative means of engaging with patients. We've managed to continue to deliver our QI programs in Mozambique and Ethiopia through video conferences, webinars. Um, we've established a grant aid fund to, uh, for essential needs such as PPE, maintaining supplies of cancer drugs. Uh, we supported the Gori Malawi Health Partnership, about which you'll hear later, which developed 14 training videos from Malawi. And we've collaborated with the Irish Global Health Network in their weekly webinars and COVID conversations. And I'm delighted to hear the Minister's earlier announcement of the Mental Health Initiative in Ethiopia. It's a great opportunity to help strengthen psychosocial support for frontline healthcare workers. So last slide, please. 
So in learning from the pandemic, um, there is uh, there is only one way, and that's um, by working collaboratively. Uh, virtual working very helpful. A blended approach to learning uh, that has been outlined by Mike Ryan, and th hopefully through this talk, and to lean into another Irish channel, Erskaha Kela Waramij, we only live in each other's shadow. It, it's only through collaboration at local, national, international level that we will be able to meaningfully engage with uh, unknown challenges that lie ahead. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Uh, very interesting talk there. Um, again, questions in the Q&A Q um, box, please. Um, I might just take moderator's privilege and, and ask one myself. Uh, following up from the very last point um, of your presentation there, that um, health partnerships, North-South health partnerships are good for the Irish uh, healthcare system, Irish hospitals. Um, can you give some uh, concrete examples of, uh, of, of how so, and how would you encourage uh, members of the HSE to, to get involved? What steps would you encourage them to take? Well, I outlined earlier at the beginning of the talk, uh, Eric, that how challenged Europe is at the moment in ways that Europe maybe somewhat arrogantly felt it would never be challenged. And uh, so our, our supposedly well-developed healthcare systems have not been able to withstand unmitigated transmission. Um, it took, it's fair to say that it took European countries and, and, and the so-called developed world longer to figure out in some cases that this, uh, the primary line of defense uh, for, for to, against COVID-19 were public health measures uh, and public health medicine and public health principles. Um, the, there's, the, the, there's no way bespoke individual treatment would save us. Uh, from the from this COVID pandemic, so um, some in preparing for this and listening to David and others, it's it's clear that the experience uh, of uh, developing countries in managing pandemics in pa in, in a cross governmental response is uh, perhaps allows those countries to get in earlier, quicker, and more effectively than has happened in some uh, developed countries. Thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, I'm afraid we have to uh, keep moving quickly on. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Henry, for your, your contribution. Um, our final speaker in this session um, is Dr. David Weekly, who has been uh, uh, already lauded, um, and rightly so, uh, by some of our previous speakers for his good work. Uh, David is director of the HSE Global Health Program uh, and a member of the HSE National Quality Improvement Team. He's a specialist in public health medicine with long experience in global health. David leads Esther Ireland, which fosters international partnerships between Irish health institutions and organizations uh, and their counterparts overseas. And indeed, David is also um, chair of the Global Health Education Ireland uh, working group in the form of Irish postgraduate medical training bodies. David. Uh, thank you, Eric. And uh, yeah, it's great to be back this year for our second symposium. Very different having to be virtual, but on the plus side, it's been great to be able to engage more people in the, the meeting because it, it is virtual. Uh, just before I speak about Global Health Education Ireland, I'd like just really to put my HSE hat on for a minute and uh, just go back to the minister's announcement and to say how, how pleased we are in the HSE to be, have the opportunity to partner with Irish Aid in this initiative to address uh, supports for health workers under the stress of the pandemic. I, mean, I think this is a really great, great initiative. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, I think we were very conscious of the pressures that, that health workers in low income settings are in. And we really uh, were, were, very, were, were uh, very keen that we could uh, find ways to support them. And it's not just for the pandemic, but for longer term, I think we, we want to be thinking, how can health workers be better supported? Because for all the challenges that, that countries face, that we need strong performing health workers and that needs good support mechanisms. And a welcome to what the minister said about just the broader health, mental health more broadly. And I hope this might be an opportunity to put more of a spotlight on mental health needs in less developed countries. I mean, they are huge and they're very under-resourced and I think there's an opportunity maybe to develop there. And next slide, please. So this is a this really short presentation is really to follow the, the previous speakers and link us to the rest of, of the meeting with the sessions two and three. 
And just to further elaborate on the context of Global Health Education Ireland. Next slide. So I'm going to just speak a little bit about some of the different aspects that have already been touched on by the different speakers that influenced our, our work in Global Health Education Ireland. And we've, we've heard quite a bit about the global perspective, the global health environment within which we work, and particularly we've, how that has been affected in recent months by the pandemic. And then there's the aid context. How, how do we as a country, how Ireland interface with that? And it's been very, very good to have the minister to share his perspectives and to think about how best as a, as, as a country we can engage with other countries in the area of training and education. And then the Irish perspective. What is it we're doing in Ireland? What is it that we can contribute? What resources and expertise do we have to contribute to this? Next slide. So first, just a little bit then about, about the global context. And um, we've already heard quite a bit about that. Next slide. And Dr. Gaia spoke to us about aligning to global health objectives. And I showed this slide last year and I'll show it probably every time because this, this, the Sustainable Development Goals gives us a clear framework for what it is we're trying to do to improve health of people at all ages and to provide better health care in order to achieve that. And the framework, the Sustainable Development Framework sets that out very clearly. But I think what it also does for us is it sets health in the broader context of health and development. And we see how health interfaces with many, many other aspects of development. And so that challenges in training and education also to think about the areas of how we address social determinants for health and how do we link with other areas like, like education and employment and the economy and so on. Next slide. And the Sustainable Development Goal Framework also gives us a lot of steer on the kind of healthcare we're trying to support through our education and training. And it's about universal health coverage, how everyone gets the healthcare they need. And, and Mike put, put a, a lot of emphasis on, on the community level. And just to remember that healthcare is right down to the communities. And it's not just about, about providing medical and curative services. We need to look at the, the full range of services. And I like that the Sustainable Development Goals have also addressed the issue of, of inequalities and how we're a challenge to leave no one behind. And that, of course, encourages us then to work as a higher income country with other countries where people don't have access currently to healthcare and how we can we support education and training to address that need. Next slide. So we, we need, every country needs an effective health workforce and, and Mike Ryan spoke quite a, quite a bit about that. And we have the global health, the global strategy for human resources for health as another guide from the WHO on how to strengthen the workforce. And Mike mentioned about the, the 18 million deficit and that's what the strategy presents, the analysis in stark terms of how there is an estimated shortfall by 20, 30 of 18 million health workers, and they're mainly in, in low and middle income countries. And the challenge is how to address that. And the strategy speaks about how to expand the workforce and also how to improve the quality of training in order to, to achieve that. And, and Mike, I think, and, and Dr. Gaia brought that right up to date for us, I think, with some of what's happening and in the response to COVID, where we've seen the the great role that, that digital technologies can play and how that's transforming the whole way in which we can go about doing education and training and the potential for scaling up using these technologies. And it's just been very interesting to, to see some of the, the WHO work that's going on very currently with, with COVID and, and we certainly will want to be learning for that. And I think also we've heard about, about the, the need for continuous learning. It's not just about training, formative training for people, but looking at the area of, of continuous learning. And the issue of co-creation, I think that was another very useful point that was made, how when we're working together with other countries, and sometimes the technologies are not available to work together to develop uh, education and training. Next slide. So we have been changed so much by COVID and I won't say too much about it, we've heard quite a lot about it already, but just a few things from me that, that, that stand out. 
mean, I think COVID has underlined the inequalities in health and healthcare across the world. And we see how some countries are less prepared and less have few resources to address the problem. And that challenges us to work more together to address these inequalities and, and strengthen health systems. And we've seen, has, as has been mentioned, how health systems everywhere have been shown to have their shortcomings with fragilities and inadequacies. And we've seen these, and, and Colin Henry referred to about some of that in Ireland, our own inadequacies. And, and so the challenge that we need to strengthen the health workforce everywhere, and we need to learn from each other how, how to do that. And the point that was made about the interruption of essential health services, and that ch challenges us to think, how can we build more resilient health systems? So when the next shock comes or the next pandemic, whatever it is that, that challenges our health services, that we don't find that our capacity is too thin and we've got more resilience. And we've seen how the pandemic has set back, not just health, but affected health, but set back socioeconomic development. And this has also been spoken about, how when we're looking at the skills we need to develop, it's not just to deliver healthcare, but it's skills to work across all the areas that affect health. So the public health skills and the other skills to be able to address social determinants of health and work effectively across the different sectors. And then lastly, there's been the disruption in, and the disruption in travel that's affected the way we work, but we've been responding to that with making more, better use of digital technologies. Next slide. So then I'm moving on to the aid context. Next slide. And the minister spoke to us about the Ireland's international development policy. And this is so helpful for us as we as, as health professionals are interfacing and interacting with other countries. This is giving us guidance on good development practice, which we want to follow. But it's also helping us to understand what is it that matters and will help us to be effective. And the strategy reminds us of the need to focus on health system development, to build long-term sustainable, resilient health systems. And I like too that the policy goes even further than just leaving no one behind. It's not about reaching everyone equally, but challenges us to reach the furthest behind first, to go out and find those who are not being reached. And that really encourages us in our global partnerships to become involved with, with low and middle income countries. And so we'll, we'll seek to con continue to do that. Next slide. And then the Irish context, next slide. And this brings us to what we're doing in global health education in Ireland. So what we have in Ireland, many health professionals and health organizations, lots of expertise and many already engage in global health activities. And that's what prompted us to come together in 2018 as, as a medical community in, in Ireland under the form of postgraduate medical training bodies to set up a global health strategic working group to bring together the capacities and the expertise, the experience of all the different medical training bodies to come together and to see how can we work to do more by working together to improve education and training. And while we are essentially a medical group, we recognize fully that what countries need is not just doctors, they need a whole range of health professionals. So in the way we're working, we very much, uh, we very much are and want to continue to be working more broadly with other disciplines in education and training. And we recognize that health workers work in teams, we need team-based approaches, and we need, and, in, and learning can be interdisciplinary as well. So last year we had our inaugural Global Health Symposium. It's been good to see even things that have moved on and developed since then. We've heard about this, the, the new Global Institute for Surgery in, in the College of, of Surgeons. The Irish College of GPs has a new global fellow, in, a, a, a clinical fellow in, in global health. So there's lots of things that, that are developing since last year and it's very, very encouraging. Next slide. So then just to move on to just to what, what we do, and this is really the, the, the themes of our sessions today will cover the two main areas that, that we're doing under this initiative, Global Health Education Ireland. One is how we support education and training with other countries. And the other then is what we do here in Ireland. Next slide. So our work with other countries, it's about a partnership approach. And we've heard that it's about how we work together. It's about how we learn from each other. And it's at two levels, I think, that we're in a broad sense that we're working. Firstly, it's about building capacity of training programs. 
we'd like to see that the countries that we work with can, can put in place their own training programs to, do, to train and educate the, the health professionals and the specialists they need. And so one of our areas of focus is on the development of national specialist postgraduate training programs. And this is about building national and regional capacities. And we've, we've heard about, we'll hear more about some of these in, in, in the, the, the second, the next session. And it's been really good to see how through the, this group under the, the, the forum that we've been able to, the specialists are working together. And we've read the example of surgery and anesthesia working together in Africa. And the other area we work is more directly involved in training, where we are involved in provision of training, working together with our partners to deliver training. And this is often at a more local level and sometimes also at national, more directly connected with frontline services and improving quality of care. And we'll hear some examples of that as well later. Next slide. And then the second main area is what we do back in Ireland. What about our own doctors, our own health professionals? What skills do they need in global health? And we have an appreciation that all doctors and all health professionals working in Ireland need to have global health competencies, reflecting the global nature of, of health and healthcare today. So our desire has been to try and to incorporate global health, develop and incorporate global health competencies into specialist training for all doctors. And that this will be developed across the continuum of medical education and training. And to develop that work, a subcommittee has been established and you'll hear more about the work in, in the second session. Next slide, please. So that's where I'm go going to finish and uh, just and, uh, look forward to the next, next two sessions. And I encourage you that to be, if you want to be in contact with, with us, that this is the email address that we're very interested to stay in touch with you as we develop this work. Thank you. Thank you, David. A fascinating talk. Uh, we have time for just one uh, one quick question. So we have a question around mental health and that uh, there was obviously the announcement from uh, Minister Brophy around the support for mental health in um, Ethiopia and Jordan, and, and you, you referred to it as well in your talk. Uh, the question is, I suppose, around the, the context um, of this. Uh, an example was given in Zambia where um, mental health is seen by many to be a Western idea, a, a Western construct. How do you address mental health issues uh, without uh, imposing, let's say, um, Western constructs on, on low middle income countries? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a very good question. And I, I think mental health uh, certainly needs to be understood in the, the local cultural context. And People will have different ways of experiencing mental stress, mental ill health. And we need to kind of understand how that's experienced and expressed and described. And, uh, and, and, and often mental health might be manifested in different ways, such as like through physical illness. So I think in our engagement with partners, I think for us, it's, it's, it's very much about listening to people in the country to hear them express how the experience of what it is to be under stress, under, under mental pressure, and to understand how that then can be best supported in the context. And we're very aware that countries have different ways of supporting each other and their mental health and well-being, and the important role that traditional practitioners can play, and the important role of, of other, others in the community that who provide support to people. And so if we're going to work effectively with, with other countries in this area, we need to do a lot of listening and understanding what from the understand from the local perspective. And it's very much about designing, having the local people design the interventions. It's not us designing them, but we can provide support to them for them to design the interventions. And we would very much uh, see that, that it needs to be led by people locally. Thanks, David. Unfortunately, in this session, we're, we're out of time. I'd love to continue the discussion in more detail. Um, I think a very clear theme that all of the speakers um, brought up was the reciprocity and the value for partners on all sides in, in these um, capacity building, health education uh, partnerships and relationships, and the scale of the task in, in front of us all. So I'd like to thank 
all of the speakers from, from session one uh, for what's been a very interesting session. Um, we're now going to take a, a five minute break and we're gonna return with session two, which is partnerships for education and training in a changing world. Thank you.